in this whole course that we are trying to teach you guys, you know, what are the major biological questions? Um, I think we, we care about transcription and uh, regulation and transcription factors. I mean, I think gene expression is just a manifestation of what the transcription factors are doing, right? So the, all the RNA-seq or microarrays or single cell RNA-seq is kind of telling us about transcription regulation. We also talk about epigenetics and chromatin factors and how they help mammalian genomes to do the transcription regulation. In, in some sense, you can think because the, the mammalian genome is so big and the important regions is only a small percentage of the genome, epigenetics is there to help identify which location is hopeless, no need to look, and which location might be more important to focus the cell to have a faster response or, or have a, a more effective response, right? Um, and then, of course, using these epigenetic data, we can help to understand human genetics. You know, when you have GWAS studies or now whole genome sequencing, rare variants, how do you annotate, you know, which of those variants might be relevant to a disease? Um, and then we talk about, you know, how to understand this gene regulation in cancers and how to identify the correct medications for the, for the patient. So based on that, we have you know, many different genomic techniques, right? We talk about gene expression you know, from RNA, uh, like microarray, RNA-seq, single-cell RNA-seq. We talk about transcription factor regulation, you know, looking at transcription factor motifs, doing a TF chip-seq. We talk about you know, epigenetics. You know, there are DNA methylation arrays. We just look at the selected CPG locations. We look at bisulfite sequencing, uh, chip-seq, DNA-seq and uh, attack-seq, and, and also high um, high c which is looking at higher-order chromatin interactions. Um, we look at the GWAS, you know, in order to study GWAS, people initially look, use uh, SNP arrays. They do, you know, case control, uh, family-based studies, uh, but recently it's all moving to sequencing, whole exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing. Yeah, so, so yeah, genome sequencing. And so genome sequencing, we have two types. One is the germline, which is, you know, basically your blood or you do a mouse uh, swab. swab. Um, it's just pretty much all of our cells will have the same DNA. But somatic mutation is what happens in cancer cells that is different from, you know, this, there's a tumor growing. What is the difference between that compared to your blood? Um, and um, we also talk about screening, which includes genetic screen, which is like CRISPR screen, or chemical screens, which are drug screens. Um, what is happening, in, I think, in the gen genomic world is, I, I think early days, there are people who are against genomics. And now you can see, um, first of all, with genomics, yes, it is more expensive. There are definitely people who are not using it in the right way, in the kind of, you know, without thinking, oh, always do genomics. But um, there are definitely still smart ways of using these genomic technologies, and you can just make discoveries so much more effectively. And what is really happening in recent years is that these genomic technologies are being combined, which become even more powerful. For example, recently there are people doing this. They do CRISPR screen first, but they, don't, they probably don't screen like thousands of genes. They can screen, say, a, a few hundred genes, whether you knock them down or you knock them out. Um, in the big cell population. And then you do single cell sequencing within each cell, and each cell will have a different gene knockout. And you can look at like how the cell responds when you knock out hundreds of genes in a single experiment, right? So that's one way of combining this. Um, another way people, uh, right now there are commercial solutions available. You buy the 10X genomics machine. Um, so if you do an experiment, say a, a T cell activation or a embryonic differentiation or some tumor treated with immunotherapy, you can now uh, just get the tissue, run this through the 10X machine. Uh, in, of course, in two separate uh, assays, you will get single cell RNA seq or single cell attack seq from the same, like pretty much from the same tissue, and you can compare the two. And there are people actually actively looking at how to analyze those data. Um, there are also people using uh, proteomics approaches um, uh, and also combination with single cell RNA-seq. So previously, um, proteomics, you do mass spec, um, which has some pros and cons, but if you, 
if you have antibodies against some gene you are interested in, so nowadays, for example, you can use an antibody, then attack, attach a DNA barcode to it, and that antibody will go to the cell, or will go to, sorry, go to the specific uh, uh, protein, bind to whatever protein target you have, but then you'll have a DNA barcode, and that DNA barcode, then you can read it out with high throughput sequencing, right? And this barcode can be read out, say, together with a single cell RNA-seq. Um, sometimes people also do two different antibodies against the same protein, and then the DNA will be somehow annealed to each other. And then you can also measure the DNA. Uh, so if basically, if two antibodies both bind to this protein, then the two DNA barcodes can anneal to each other. You will be able to see the DNA amplification. Then you can be able, you, you can see it from a high throughput sequencing, right? So you can see people are combining some proteomics to the uh, uh, high throughput sequencing now. And uh, uh, very recently, people are also starting to look at uh, imaging. You know how to combine imaging with single cell. Um, say RNA-seq or single cell chromatin profiling. Um, so Harvard uh, Salve Zhuang's lab is really an, a pioneer in this. So they, so, so, um, they, they also, again, use barcode. Um, so they, they, they have a probe that targets a particular RNA that can anneal to the RNA. And at the end, um, so, so there is a barcode attached to a probe. And if the probe can hybridize to the, to the RNA transcript in the cell, then you will be able to sequence out the barcodes. So of course, they hybridize and they wash off, right? So you can imagine, um, and, and at the end, they just do high, uh, like um, imaging to look at, you know, the barcode location in, in, in the particular frame with, say, a few hundred cells. And so there they can look at hundreds to thousands of transcripts together in a single cell in resolution. So you can see whether that particular transcript is happening in one cell type or another cell type, or you can even see whether it's in the cell cytoplasm or in the cell nucleus. So you can really see the um, subcellular locations of those cells, uh, of those transcripts. And so you can see all of this are happening. You know, the people who I would say, the people who refuse to pick up genomics, they will be more and more behind. And also, I think for experimental biologists, um, you cannot completely rely on computation, collaborating with computational biologists. I mean, for, for the students in this course, I would want to congratulate yourself for taking this, I would say, a lot of work in you know, this course. But really, in a few months, you learn a lot because one day you're gonna do some genomic ex experiment and it's not uncommon for people to do an experiment in three months and spend the next six months analyzing their data, right? And so um, if you don't learn to get started, you know, in the future, it will be like genomic experiment one combined with genomic experiment two plus three plus four, right? And so if you kind of get started, you can see, okay, at least I understand my experiment is working. You know, if it doesn't work, which step went wrong? You know, so I think you'll be much, much more um, effective to start bite the bullet and learn it now because I think genomic will get more and more complicated and, and high throughput. Yes, question. Uh, because the, I think it's because the, the, the probe knows which transcript it is, and the barcode I think is like if like uh, some fluorescent labeled, so you can you know shine light and figure out you know which um, which location has which barcode. Yeah, so the barcode is actually pretty short. Say with with eight cycles, you will know okay that 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 barcode is going is on that transcript. Because the, the, the probe is very long, you can't sequence for, in, in situ from imaging for that long. Okay, yeah, but these technologies are under constant development. You know, you might need also imaging related uh, expertise as well. So that's a, beyond this course, but it's really happening. Um, so why is this course offered as a statistics course? Um, I would say, well, if you look at what we have learned, we learn R, we learn bioconductor, well, I also see as, I guess, bioconductor, we learn Python programming, right? 
um, actually, we didn't quite learn two key by weight. That was the early micro array day, but we, we learned medium polish for RMA. We learned quantile normalization, right? We, we learned to look at whether the data is normally distributed using QQ plot. We looked at, you know, t-test um, or modified t-test. We look at chi-square test. A lot of, the, anytime you have a two by two table, you were looking at a chi-square test. You look at a common of Smirnoff test for gene set enrichment analysis, right, for a CRISPR screen. Um, and also very important thing is you always want to do multiple hypothesis testing adjustment. So um, false discovery rate adjustment is always useful. Um, we talk about hierarchical models, or um, which is how do you borrow information from other genes? Say, when you try to estimate the variance of some say either microarrays or art, art, the, the expression index or the read count for expression of a gene, because a lot of these experiments that we are dealing with in um, genomics, you have like two to three replicates, and you can't really estimate the variance very well. So the, the hierarchical models really try to use all the genes to help you estimate a more accurate variance in case just from data you have too noisy or just unexpected uh, uh, noise, right? And uh, we, we talk about gen generalized linear models, which is used in Lima and also in MAGIC to identify you, when you have more conditions, right? How do you identify uh, the effect of different treatments or conditions, right? We talk about clustering, you know, there's like a K means, a hierarchical clustering, also actually principal component analysis and, and also TSNI plots. Yeah, we talk about principal, yeah, principal component analysis. Also, we talk about, you know, support vector machines, you know, some machine learning approaches. Um, for uh, read mapping, we talk about burroughs wheeler alignment. Um, actually, this year, we also briefly talk about suffix arrays, you know, how to use suffix trees or suffix arrays for read alignment. We talk about expectation, maximization, and give sampling for motif analysis. Um, and we talk about hidden Markov model and dynamic programming and use this for um, identify chromatin states or uh, predict protein structures, right? Um, we talk about lasso or logistic regression and how to identify features that are important. And you can use it to look at which features are important for response to a drug or to whether the CRISPR screen is working or uh, which genes really um, um, are important for survival or factors are important for, for survival and things like that, right? Yeah, we, we also talk about survival analysis. Um, and so we also talk about a lot of bio, sorry, it should be bioinformatics uh, algorithms, right? So uh, there's RMA, LIMA, um, there's for, for microarrays, for David and GSEA for, you know, gene ontology <coughs> and pathway enrichment, combat for, um, for batch effect removal. And for next generation sequencing, we talk about FASTQC, right? We talk about BWA and STAR for read mapping for RNA-seq uh, or like CHIP-seq. Um, for RNA, there's the RNA-seq QC and SALMON for giving you, uh, actually we also did, uh, yeah, STAR, but SALMON for giving you that pseudo alignment and also gene expression um, estimate. And DE-seq for differential expression, Right. For single cell RNA seq, we talk about SURAT. For chip seq or DNA seq, we talk about MAX or and also systrome analysis. Uh, for genome sequencing, you know, we talk about Mutect, Cravat, uh, Chasm. Oh, there were also motif analysis there. You know, CRISPR screens, we talk about MAGIC. Um, and for immunology, we talk about Polysolver, NetMHC, CyberSword, Trans and Tide. And so, um, so I'm hoping, you know, there is no way for this course we can teach you all the bioinformatics tools you're going to use for your research and later on. And in fact, we are changing this course every year. Um, you know, in the early days, we, we, people are still developing new RNA-seq tools. But I think not, now that's kind of pretty more mature. But starting from, you know, uh, R, single cell RNA-seq, I think, or a mutation cause, uh, immune-related uh, algorithms. Still, there are so many new things being developed right right now. Um, so uh, I'm hoping that from this course, you will learn to say, okay, if there's a new tool, I can learn how to install it, 
and can read the readme, maybe read their papers and figure out roughly how to kind of run it and look at the result to figure out, did I run it correctly? Um, does my experiment work or, or things like that? So we are hoping that this course just build the foundation so you are not afraid to learn new algorithms in the future. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, in the very beginning, the very first class, uh, we, we kind of showed you the different levels of bioinformatics research, right? So the level zero, I'm just going to go over this again. Level zero uh, bioinformatics is modeling for modeling sake. You know, like, yeah, they're just creating a problem for their own. This is the Kung Panda level zero. Um, and so... <coughs> Usually, you know, you published in low-impact non-biological journals and only read and cited by non-biologists. They, they kind of create a problem that's really very few biologists even care about or, or even computational biologists don't really care about, right? That's, we're hoping that you don't do this in, in your research, right? What we're teaching you to do in this course is mostly level one, how to analyze some either published or unpublished data from a collaborator's project, right? Um, is the, so, so what you want to ask, you know, when your collaborator come to you to ask for help, you, you ask, is this a biologically important problem? Are there existing algorithms to analyze the data? Is this experiment, you know, designed well? And you can also f find out whether this is a good collaboration, you know, whether the analysis and experiments, they kind of feed each other based on the result, the experimentalist might change their study plan to go, you know, do more profiling in one way or do validation in another way, um, rather than uh, this person has generated all the data there is, and they come to you and they don't want to do any more experiment. It's like, okay, you know, whatever you can come together, let's integrate and publish. That's not very good at, at level one bioinformatics, right? Um, yeah, does the study have real biological findings or do they have any hypothesis, right? Does the experimental group value the informatics contribution? Um, and so this really teach you kind of, uh, yeah, so yeah, so here, um, is a, I would say you are just mostly learning to deal with the data and kind of clean up, you know, analyze, process, QC, you know, try to find something interesting, right? Can I learn the domain biological knowledge? So when you are involved in those kind of collaboration, you want to ask your collaborators, um, what question do you want to solve? Do you have any hypothesis what's going on? And we can use the data to help them understand, okay, maybe this hypothesis is not, is not quite right. Or the data doesn't support this. Or maybe there's some unexpected twist to this. Um, they can find something new, right? So, um, yes, I did write this as kind of a data janitor. But, you know, I think uh, being a data janitor is good, but you hope that you can do better, right? Um, but that's kind of the beginning point. Um, that, that is what we are trying to teach you in this course, how to analyze data. Um, the second level of bioinformatics research is, um, I'm hoping that you can actually see that uh, a lot of the tools developed are also by computational biologists. We're not asking you in this course to develop a DEC tool or develop a MAX or develop a, a, a SURAT. I mean, that's asking too much. But if you are going to be a computer, if you want to be a computational biologist, PhD student or, or postdoc, after this course, then you will really be involved in some research. And maybe you will say, okay, you know, in two to three years, I will be able to develop a tool that help a lot of people, not just my own collaborator, right? So, and so there, um, you need to keep a keen eye on cost-effective new techniques. Um, do, do we think that we know completely all the problems or uh, biases in microarrays? You know, have we solved all the problems? Probably not. You know, you can solve most of the problems, the major problems, but too bad nobody's using microarrays now. So let's move on. So um, make sure that when you are a computational biologist, if you are going to develop a tool, this is a, you, you can see the pain point, right? This is a technology that's really powerful. A lot of people are going to really use it, and yet they are getting stuck on this one problem that can't be solved. That's where I think computational biologists can really make a difference. You develop a tool, it helps like thousands of scientists, right? Um, yeah, so make sure you use some statistics and develop user-friendly software. Um, so if you look at the previous um, uh, 
the, all the tools that are developed. As I mentioned before, we see an interesting trend. If the, the, the analysis deal with numbers, that's where statisticians usually develop a good tool. But if this tool is based on calling a nucleotide change or you know, alignment, you find a location, that's where computer scientists really develop the best tools. And so, you know, like depending on what your background, maybe you can focus your attention on the right direction. You know, you know what you're good at and really take advantage of, of that. Um, and so are we using some statistics? And also when you develop a tool, is this user friendly? Because at the end, whether people use it or not, it's just, you know, if it's a low hanging fruit, you just go with the easiest tool. Um, and then after the, the algorithm is published, does this group continue to maintain and update the algorithm, fix the bugs, add new features to really make it useful for many people? Um, and also really collaborate with more biologists to see, okay, you know, yes, I solved uh, these questions, but you know, the, the next step of the biological question is still un unsolved. Can we use computational approaches to help them answer those biological questions and really provide the features towards answering those biological questions, right? To really provide the complete solution to that domain problem. And I think in general, uh, if you look at computational algorithms, there is a big difference between whether this is published just in like a plus one versus something that's published in a higher journal like Nature Biotechnology or, or Genome Biology. But very often, many, many, uh, uh, there, there's, there could be no big difference between a bioinformatics algorithm that's published in nucleic acid research versus Nature. Uh, really, time is the ultimate measure. It doesn't really matter where this tool is published. Um, is this algorithm widely used, widely cited? Do people use it to make real findings? And that really evaluates whether the bioinformatics tool is good. Um, doesn't matter where it's published. You know? So in the long run, you know, the computational biologists do well by doing good. Even if you, you know, uh, so we use BWA a lot. Actually, BWA is published in bioinformatics, which has an impact factor around five. And we use it all the time, right? So at the end, the, the community will give credit to the scientists who develop these tools that are used a lot. Level three bioinformatics, I think, is a lot of time is nowadays uh, for computational biologists, like we do mostly, actually we do one to kind of help some of our collaborators. We do two to develop tools, but at the same time, we are doing more and more level three bioinformatics because there's so much data in the public domain. Um, you know, when I was a PhD student, we have to kind of go to people and say, oh gosh, you have this really cool new experiment. Can I look at your data before it's published? You know, can we collaborate? And they would say, well, I'm already collaborating with this scientist. I don't want to, you know, have com competitions within. Maybe you should talk to them to see whether you can also look at our data. And about 10, 15 years ago, it's kind of uh, more the case that um, a lot of computation, uh, a lot of biologists would come to a computational biologist to say, hey, we have data, can you help us ana analyze? But nowadays it's like, there's so much public data. We can integrate these public data to already make discoveries. And very often we go back to the collaborator that we helped before with level one informatics to say, hey, we made a prediction. Can you help us validate? And so now collaboration becomes two, like uh, they, they help each other. So this is really happening now, right? This is real, like a big data mining. Uh, you are really mining the data. Um, we need to actually understand enough biology to have a unique biological angle, angle and not necessarily, well, if you, if you use sophisticated algorithm, that's fine. But if you can use very simple tools to answer a big biological question from a lot of data, by all means, go for it, right? That's really cool. Um, so here, we want to use novel, you know, like make novel biological discoveries rather than uh, putting the numbers on theory. Sometimes you can see this type of collaborations. The biologists already know this hypothesis. They already have some experiment. And now they're like, oh, uh, put a theoretical foundations on this by looking at more data, which uh, I'm not sure this is necessarily the best one. Yeah, as we mentioned, sometimes you might need an experimental validation. 
um, by either the informatics group or by the experimental collaborators. And so you can see more and more, and more of this happening. Um, and then there is also Level X Bioinformatics, which is an uh, integrative paper from Big Science Consortium. Uh, this is like team science. You know, sometimes you can see this. They have numbers on a paper title, say uh, mutation profiles of 800 uh, AML patients or, or something like that. You will just know that's the case. Um, um, yeah, so it's kind of takes a lot of resources, you know, it's very time consuming. Um, yeah, there's a lot of turf fight within the consortium about who is going to be the first and last author. So uh, these are usually published in high profile journals, highly cited because of the data. And um, uh, very often there's like a lot of negotiations with the journals going on. And um, so the trainees, uh, very often, if your API is in a powerful position, the trainees will get a first author or a co-first author. Um, it's good to be involved in some just so that you know the major players in the field, but uh, we want to make sure that people involved in those projects, they also know how to do their own level two, level three research. Otherwise, one day they might go out and really become quite clueless. Um, yeah, so I would say uh, a good informatics group should uh, not sacrifice, yeah, should not sacrifice one, two, three for only level X research. But at the same time, I think a good bioinformatics group probably should be involved in all four areas, right? So um, the level one informatics is a beginning stage. And very often, say, if I want to go to cancer immunology, I want to learn from the best immunologists. The easiest way is to say, I have very good computational skills. Can I help a, a, a immunologist analyzing data? At the same time, I can learn a lot, right? And from this, it's like, oh, OK, there's a new data type that can answer these questions but they need two developments. So we develop a tool with a level two, but then if this tool become really popular, a lot of people develop uh, or using these technology to generate data. When there are enough public data available already, we can integrate all the data to make the level three discoveries. And by that time, you can go to your original collaborator to say, can you help me validate, right? And, th and then um, level X usually indicate this person has made it. You know, you're a big shot already. You get involved in these big consortiums or foundations, right? So that's also helpful. Um, so you, you, you can have more resources, get to know more people. So that's uh, the different level of informatics. So depending on where you are, I think, um, um, I think level one is a good start. This is just the first course and we're hoping that you will learn more in the future, okay? Now, 